All right. Um, hello, I am Hernan Garcia, and I want to welcome you to the eighth talk in the 2020 No Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the goal of this seminar is to showcase NOAA's leadership in, in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. First, I want to acknowledge my partners who worked to make this seminar series, Sandra Clark with the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation, Kathy Rowley with the NOAA OER's NOAA Central Library, and Tracy Gill with the National Ocean Service National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Before we start, here are some seminar logistics. Uh, please type your questions and comments relating to the seminar into the Q&A box at any time, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the seminar. We will be recording this seminar for later viewing, and the recording and a PDF of the, the slides will be made available tomorrow at the link provided in the chat box. Today's seminar is titled Working to Provide an Integrated Digital Understanding of Our Earth Environment to Meet NOAA and the World Needs by Dr. Steve Volz. Dr. Volz is the NOAA's Assistant Administrator for the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, or NESDIS, and he has more than 30 years of professional experience in aerospace. As NESDIS Assistant Administrator, Dr. Volz sets the strategic vision and implementation objectives for the nation's civilian operational Earth Observing Satellite Fleet. He served as the co-chair of the NOAA Observing Systems Council and is a member of the NOAA Executive Council. He is a leader in the International Earth Observing Community, serving as the NOAA principal to the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites and the coordinating group for meteorological satellites. Steve leads efforts to coordinate global satellite-based observations among international space agency partners to meet global weather and environmental monitoring and forecasting efforts. Thank you, Steve, for your leadership and for presenting at the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar series today. Here you go, please. So thank you, Renan, and thank you, Tracy, and, and the whole team for setting these up. I had a chance. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, this talk today. I had a chance to look through the slides of the last several of the last presentations, and I was remarkable in the variety and the complexity, the depth, the breadth of all of the uh, different elements of presented by the other NOAA leaders, and uh, it's a big it's a, it's a big uh, lead to follow, and I hope we do well today. Um, so I was also reminded to speak slowly enough that I don't overwhelm the uh, the, the closed captioning. So I'll do my best for both of those. So I took the liberty of changing the title a little bit on my own. I, when I think about as I thought about what I would be presenting today, and to uh, and you see on this page is a little bit different. It's, it is still related to providing digital understanding of our Earth environment to the world, but we sort of encapsulated that in a shorter version of creating a digital Earth. And it, and um, we, when you talk about NESIS, it's often about satellites, but um, the second half of NESIS is the environmental satellites, but it's also the data and information system. So the information is where is the value of what we do. Um, um, and the satellites are how we collect it, but it's what we present and what we provide that's really key. So we'll, it, the digital earth really is, is, is the essence of changing, the pretty, going from pretty pictures to critical and useful information. And that's where I think NESDIS plays a key role um, as an intermediary in much of the work that we do with our partners internal to NOAA and around the world. So a brief outline. Um, we will be talking, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about NESDIS's mission for those who online who are not familiar with NESDIS. When I came here five years ago, I wasn't familiar enough with NESDIS to be able to explain the breadth of the mission. Um, a brief history of the uh, satellite Earth observations, uh, and you'll understand why I'm going into a history lesson when we talk about what our leadership role is going into the future, because we have been, the role that we play now is, is sort of a continuation of the leading role we've played for the last 60 years last 50 years, I should say, of satellite Earth observations, and how we fit into the global observing system. So what is our role and how has it changed? And, and I think in, in a substantive way, it has changed in the last few years, and that's where the leading, what we're trying to do with NES is to reflect that change and to um, remain relevant and important and critical to the global Earth observations um, with, our, with our deliveries and our services. So from a 
strictly uh, organizational role, we have a mission essential requirement to provide for the national security, safety, and prosperity. Um, we, we have what we call program mission essential functions. Um, which provide the, we operate the nation's weather satellites on 24-7, 20, 365. Um, and I like to also say forever. And that's the expectation. And, and we want um, the weather forecasting and the information we provide to be as like, to be as reliable as, or more reliable than electrical when you plug in your power. You know, our power doesn't go down and we make sure that it doesn't. Our services are continuous. We can provide and we acquire NOAA's Earth and Sun observation satellites for forecasting to do that. Um, we provide the data and imagery for all the modeling of both atmospheric and weather modeling, but also, in, as we'll see, expanding environmental modeling and forecasting as well. It's not just um, weather. It's not just the atmosphere, but it's the, the land and the air, um, the water. Um, and now we're talking about the solar um, system as well uh, in the solar physics that we are observing. We provide, in addition to the, just the daily, hourly weather information, definitive assessments of U.S. and global climate. Um, we have a series of regular and consistent, re reliable uh, forecasts and or assessments of what the, the state of the climate what, on weekly, monthly, annual basis, uh, which are referred to by uh, people around the world as the definitive uh, go-to answer. And as part of that um, is is we maintain one of the most significant data archives for environmental data on the planet. It's not just satellite data. NESDIS provides the data storage for all of the, uh, for NOAA writ large. So all of the uh, observations we make are, are intended to be part of our national archives. It's a challenge to get all those data sets in, and that's part of our challenge going forward. But um, we do bring these all together. And when you think about any observation, you can rely on from NESDIS um, in our services to to place it in context of what's happened over the past 50 years, and in some cases, the past 1,000 years. We even have a paleo, um, paleo weather group, which looks at tree rings and other um, older assets and to understand the climate changes over the last 1,000 years. So the observations definitely predate satellites, and the information content is long term. The note on the bottom is that without the satellites, uh, you wouldn't have the weather forecast models you have today. 95% of the data used in forecast models comes from satellites. Only about half of that comes from NOAA satellites, which is a key feature you're going to talk about. The other half comes from our partners. Um, but without that, without all of our, our contributions, we wouldn't have the forecasting capabilities we have today. We are not alone in space. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's kind of a punchline. Um, but in the space sector for the U.S., there are other players who participate. Um, NASA, everybody knows NASA. NASA, 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 we say in terms of space and, and exploration. Um, but they're the research side, if you will, the exploration side of space and in Earth observations as well. And we're the operational and the utilization side in partner with them. USGS has a, a role, critical role as well, for land imaging, land remote observations and land use applications. And the three of us are partners working together in many different internal for in the US, uh, managing the Earth observing system um, uh, for, the, for the nation. Um, and there's the Defense Department on the side as well, who have for historically taken been active partners in observations. They obviously have a different mission focus, a different customer base they have to work with and supply. But weather is weather, so the forecast, the information, the observations are just as important to them, although they may uh, develop different products for their specific mission needs. But we do work in many different ways, many different um, uh, communities and groups in parallel with these different organizations so that we share, um, we share assets, that we share observing systems, we share data, and as, we, as you'll see going forward, we expect, and, and NESDIS is the lead in this role, to increase that cross-talk and collaboration and sharing so that we really can speak to one national observing system and, and uh, as we talk globally, one global observing system so all the data are brought together and, and NOAA really is the lead in, in that activity. So let's talk a little bit about the history of where we are and where we got to. Um, we are as old as Sputnik, or a little bit, little bit younger, but as old as NASA in, in the beginning in the late 50s, or in the early 60s, with the Explorer 1 in 58, and the first Tyro satellite, which is the first, um, uh, give you the whole disk image of the of this Earth. And Tyro's just celebrated its 60-year um, anniversary uh, this year in 2020. And here you see a picture of the first satellite, television satellite picture from space. Um, and this was uh, 
one of the remarkable things, and you will see this theme in the next couple of um, slides here, is that every step forward in technology opens up a new window into what's understanding and what's possible. And, and um, the first images from space actually had some sounding rockets in the late 40s and early 50s, but this is the first orbiting satellite. Um, made possible, made clear to weather forecasters the value of seeing the broader view of what was potentially possible um, from, from satellite observations. We followed that with the start of, uh, in 1970, when NOAA was instantiated, a long-term, prior to NOAA was ESA, ESSA, a long-term NASA-NOAA partnership where NASA does the technology development um, and helps build and build their satellites, and now with industry as well. And NOAA then takes these and with its combination with the Weather Service and with the other services, combines those into operational systems and forecasting observations. 20 years after Tyros, we had the GOES series, the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite Series. Um, geostationary, obviously, if at uh, orbiting the Earth at a point um, at the same rotation speed as the planet, so it's stationary over the Earth at the equator. This is um, a GOES-1 first image, and you'll see others over 1979. You know, I, I got to wonder, this is probably not GOES-1, because I'm looking, and I'm seeing a looking at the East Africa which is not where GOES would be located. It could be a misprint, but it's that era of satellite observation. Um, and you can see, just comparing that with the previous picture, the leap forward in accuracy, resolution, and, and imagery, and the greater ca capability of what you can do with that. So each of these generations, and you've gone through now where it goes 17 is in orbit, um, and or at NOAA 20 for our polar satellites, each time we have a generational change in these satellites, we get an increase in performance. And we are now... Uh, exploiting the next generation of, go of geostationary and polar satellites and the NOAA 20 and the GO 16. And as I said, as we go from these steps from one to the next, we add incredible capacity. And here you look at the, the last upgrade from the GO 13, which is the previous generation, to GO 16, which is the GO R series, which we have in space now. And <clears throat> the movies and the activities you see on the news and the TV in the evening come from our ghost era satellites, which are 16 channels instead of five in terms of spectral bands, um, infrared channel, higher data rates and higher resolution. So we have 60 times the information content coming from these and a more rapid scan. So we have more rapid features. We can image and track features now with one minute updates on a hemispherical basis, which provides for those dynamic movies, which unfortunately I can't show in this format, but allows us to see the world in a different way. And every time we go through the generation changes, we are enabling a different piece of, or a, a different part of analysis, different capability in analysis. And these are just some snapshots I'll show in the example. This is from uh, the GOES satellite, GOES-16, showing Hurricane Michael. Um, and the eye of the hurricane clearly delineated here. And the point in, in these series of pictures is the increase in, in, in capability of the individual satellites, and this happens not just in space, but in all our observation observing systems, leads to greater, to new insights. And usually not those insights, and not only those insights anticipated by the technologists and the scientists and the engineers who built and envisioned what would be possible, but we see new phenomena. And here's an infrared picture from SUMI NTP or VIRS, uh, which is our imaging camera on our lower Earth orbit. And this is an infrared I-band channel in the 5 to 11 micro micrometer channel. And the remarkable level of detail here in terms of the temperatures and the variability and the spatial variability. And if you look at the outer bands of this particular hurricane, Dorian, as it was unfortunately sitting over the Grand Bahamas for almost a day, the, the details that are provided by these satellites are provided not just greater awareness of what's happening in a severe event like this, but greater understanding of the physics and the dynamics of the systems themselves so that you can pinpoint specific high, out, high intensity rainfall across a, a 500 kilometer, 500 mile radius. So you can actually pinpoint events in multiple, with one picture in multiple communities and not just there's a hurricane coming, but it's going to hit this part of the coast and not that part 20 kilometers away and the rain's going to be, be worse in one area versus another. Each of these steps forward in technology allow us and sort of demand on us that we understand better and use that information more efficiently. It's driving changes in our systems throughout. It's not just more data and more information to process. It's 
well, it is more information to provide, but on the receiving side, and this is something we've become very aware of, it's more information to interpret and to ingest by the users. And what we have found in the recent years is that we are overwhelming, we, we, are e we can easily overwhelm the user and the communities that rely on us for information with too much information. So it's, it's great and it's beautiful, but it's also overwhelming. As anybody who tries to find an information on the internet can find out, you know, how do I trust and how do I know what I'm supposed to look for? This is a picture showing a new instrument that we added in GOES, um, the GOES R series, which they like the lightning mapper, which is a special instrument with a high repeat rate, two kilohertz cycle, to look for high energy discharges of lightning. And the blue dots here, again, this is more impressive than a movie. You can see as the hurricane is progressing where the lightning bands occur. Um, and this is a research instrument that we knew, we felt would be impactful and interesting. Um, and we're still trying to figure out four years after its launch how to use it completely. And we will be figuring that out, I think, for another 20 years. But the science and the physics and the atmospheric dynamics we're picking up from this is opening up new vistas of, of research and of understanding of the atmosphere as we go forward. Um, but again, this is an example. And this is also superimposes this on the, the, the low Earth orbit satellite SUMI, which shows the day-night band where lights were. Um, of where the greater observations open up different questions and different answers on, on challenges of how we understand the system. This is a picture from GOES again looking at Africa. And you see on the west, on the right there, Sahara, and the dust storms that come over Africa. Um, and we just had an incident recently this summer um, with the dust over the sun, sunsets and sunrises in the Gulf of Mexico were significantly enhanced, if you will, the color and the dynamics and the air quality was reduced because of these massive dust storms flying off of, off of um, the uh, Saharan Desert. Monitoring these, these are pretty pictures, but they're also the information of these satellites is sufficient enough to be quantitative in what they're able to provide. So you can actually measure the amount of nutrients or material that goes into the ocean and then tie this to things like algal blooms and, and nutrient content in the ocean for uh, ocean dynamics and, and oceanography. And here's another example of GOES. And I put this up because it can show you we're not just looking at the atmosphere. This is an infrared from the GOES R series, infrared picture, and, and it's of Central America on the, on the upper side there, um, and the Pacific Ocean on the lower, the left uh, three quarters. And, and you can, as an infrared, you can see the colors indicate different temperatures of water vapor in the atmosphere. But looking through that, you see the swirls and the eddies, those are ocean currents and ocean temperature variations. Um, and all of these, you can now not, you can use these atmospheric monitoring satellites as oceanography um, detecting satellites. And combining these measurements with in situ ship measurements, with airborne measurements, allow us for a much richer, potentially, an understanding of the dynamics of ecosystem modeling and not just atmospheric modeling. Challenging us to use these data is one of the, the hallmarks of what new observations bring to us. And the last one I would say is, is as we've added um, and been monitoring over the years, is space weather. Um, and this is uh, goes in the, uh, I think it's the ultraviolet, showing the, the solar imagery of the, of the sun. Um, and this is where we're looking for flares and coronal mass ejections. Um, and the timeliness of these and adding these into our, our forecast for space weather are another growing aspect of, of the portfolio of observations that NOAA is now providing. So as I said, we're at the threshold, we're at the introduction of the next generation, and we are ahead of, uh, right on the front edge of, of the Europeans and our Asian our partners in, in providing these assets. Um, but we have been moving along with the rest of the system. And there are a lot of change in the global system, and we're in the midst of a very dynamic change in the environment. And I talk about the environment writ large, not just the, the physical, but also the, the technological and the political environment. We are experiencing, these are the, the environment we have to respond to as we plan for the next generation of missions and as we plan to utilize this generation. There's an unprecedented pace of innovation taking place in technology, as we've seen in the satellites, but it's even faster growing in the ground systems. The technology advancement in artificial intelligence and machine learning, the computing capabilities, the availability of high speed computing, not to mention the access to cloud for, and, uh, for massive processing and for rapid distribution of data. It used to be we had to build all of our own data pipelines, and that's not the case going forward. There's a significantly increased demand 
for timelier and more accurate and more tailored predictions of extreme events delivered in ways that to cell phones and even and simple devices, not just to your you know, weather forecast office for a phone call or for a newscast. Um, so that we're seeing a great democratization of the user community. And that user community is very demanding. It's coming back with, I, I don't like the way you did this, or if I don't like it, they don't even tell us they don't like it, they go somewhere else. So our, our need to be responsive to that is critical. There's increased sensitivity to in, in the infrastructure to these environmental effects. You've seen this, um, both population density and the migrations uh, and the increase in density along the coast, which happen to be the place where you have sea level rise, coastal inundation, severe storms. These are coming together in the worst way in a combination of factors, which mean that our infrastructure is sensitive to these environmental effects. And our, so our forecast can't just be what's going to happen next week and, or tomorrow for rain. It's what's going to happen in 10 years for drought or for sea level rise or for um, desertification or for um, other environmental effects. So that long-term data record and that long-term forecasting, the weather service is looking at season to subseasonal. And for our climate forecasting, we're the gap between a 100-year forecast of climate and one-year forecast of weather is rapidly diminishing to there's almost a seamless transition from for weather forecast to climate forecast, and the differences are, are going away. The emerging capabilities in the U.S. industry and our international partners is changing the way that we collect data and the amount of data we can collect, um, both in the technology on orbit and how do we get to orbit and how do we distribute the data once it's on the ground. And I mentioned space weather at the end. All of our assets, as they become miniaturized and more electronic and more um, reliant on instant communication, are becoming more sensitive to the effects of space weather. So how do we, how do we fold space weather forecasting, which we don't do yet very well, into our system so that we assure that primary mission essential function I mentioned up front, which is to ensure the reliability of the U.S. infrastructure. Just one snapshot here of the change over the last 40 years. It used to be it was a national, it was a government asset to get to do space observations. If you look back to as recently as 1980, 30 year, 20 years after the start of the space age, most of the satellites uh, we had NOAA alone was 14 percent of the EO Earth observation assets in orbit. That included global, not just U.S. but global. Now, 20, 40 years later, we're about two percent or less. And if you project this forward five years, you may have the constellations you've seen with thousands of satellites in orbit. So the relative number of satellites we provide relative to the rest of the constellation is rapidly diminishing to a negligible size. Now, all satellites are not equal in quality. Um, certainly, our GO satellite is higher quality, higher reliability and performance than, than something that a, a planet might launch on a three-color, an RGB color mapper. But the, with the increasing computing power and the value and the, and the capability of these individual satellites, the aggregate of co co contributions of these smaller satellites is a comparable one to us. And we need to change the way we do business. We can't assume we're the only ones providing data, or we will not be the one, the go-to source for, uh, for uh, providing data. And this, this trend is something which I don't see as a, I see as a threat in one way, but as an opportunity in another, if we can guide the int intellect, the investments and the uh, trajectory of these multiple assets, we can really benefit from the use of all of those. So NOAA has its own constellation of satellites. We, and this is a, a shot which shows our GOES and our JPS as our polar series, as well as some of our other smaller satellites. Uh, on the order, of we operate 18 satellites in orbit now, and we expect to operate 10 to 15 or so over the coming years. But we are not alone in that. Our science division at NASA has a tens or, or 20 instruments in space on a regular basis. ESA is providing their own Earth observing systems. And the European Union has created in the last 10 years uh, the Copernicus program, which is looking to have equal to or greater numbers and equal capacity and capability of satellites that make the same type of measurements we do, but not, not redundant, but complementary. And, and we are not the only ones doing this, as I mentioned. Airbus, um, SpaceX, Blue Origin are talking about thousands of satellites in space. So our system, our approach, if we're going to be the data and information service um, for the nation and the info and Earth, Earth satellite system for NOAA, is how do we take, how do we make best use of the investments we have and of the investments of the world and guide that to a way that allows us to be productive and to deliver our mission best? 
And that requires that we work together with all of these players and that we, we foster and encourage a collaboration. Um, and, and really, we, we start with the needs. Um, this is a chart. I pulled a couple of charts from previous leadership seminars. This is from um, Cisco Werner uh, talking about the uh, fisheries. You look at this chart. I, I, I look at this chart in particular because they have mission needs which go from the day and the kilometer scale to the century and the, and the global scale. No one observing system, no one satellite is going to answer questions that are dragged by uh, over this range of time and space. But the overall system can and needs to be tapped into and utilized to address all of these in different ways. And you don't do these. You don't sit there and focus on, I'm going to do a resilience and sustainability question for fishers. And, or maybe I'm going to do a monitoring, monitoring and closure uh, objective. Looking at these, you really need an integrated Earth observation system and an integrated Earth system model to bring all these together. Similarly, on the Weather Service, um, to build a weather-ready nation, we can't develop a system for every individual user or, and the users which may be local, regional, global, or, you know, or near-term or long-term. We want a system that is scalable and, and variable that can address the user needs across the whole spectrum of applications. And again, it's not, we can't afford to tailor each one, but we have to start with an integrated concept of how all these play together. Our system, systems are, are used to mitigate the impacts of the billion dollar disaster, the multiple disasters we see. This is an output from, from NESIS's annual reports on, on economic impact to the nation. Um, and that led us to an understanding to get away from utilizing Earth satellites to providing an integrated digital understanding of our environment. This is how we've reframed uh, over the last couple of years the, the mission of, as NESDA sees it to provide a truly integrated digital understanding of our environment, something that can evolve quickly to meet changing user needs and expectations because as we learn more, we want to know more and we need to understand more. And by leveraging not just our satellites, but our partnerships as well. So the significant investment in, um, that we've made over the past half century in partnerships is really poising, it's poised us to be ready and able to leverage those and to guide those partnerships and our partners so that we can make the best use of the integrated global observing system. So how do we refocus? And in the last couple of years then, the last two years, we've refocused our efforts to think about instead of building the best of everything, to build a place to focus our energies where we have the strong leadership roles and to provide leadership elsewhere. So the first one, we have been from the get from the first, NOAA and NASA working together have established what's best and how do we do observations from geostationary and, and space weather and space orbits. We want to continue and maintain that. So our first objective is going building the next best geostationary observing system. And by doing that, to guide and pull other agencies around the world to follow our lead and do the same type of measurements globally so that we can bring all those together. In LEO, Low Earth Orbit is what LEO stands for, we recognize there's a, it, we've already had the democratization of, of satellites in low Earth orbit. That picture I showed a few minutes ago with the three or four different agencies providing tens of satellites. They are, these are first-rate satellites which 25 years ago were not available other than from NASA and NOAA, but now are. So we need to take advantage of that, which means we deploy targeted capabilities which are not done by others. And with the third step here, we bring all of these data together. We provide a ground system that improves the ingest of data from all of these sources and then integrates those into in a seamless way in near real time. So the data from a, from a European Union Copernicus environmental satellite is merged in real time with a NOAA weather satellite to provide a forecast capability to a weather forecast operator working in Seattle, Washington. And they don't care or know where all those data come from, but our job is to make sure it happens and get to them every day without interruption within minutes of observation. So the scale of this is not the current capability. In overall, it is in some example cases, but we see it is certainly possible and doable. The only way that this can be done efficiently and effectively is if we understand how the data are used and we understand and we can deliver updated products on a regular basis. So the fourth and fifth initiatives, the strategic foci that we have, are to develop a systematic, ongoing, enterprise-wide user engagement process, which allows us to not only understand 
who are immediate customers. I may be delivering data to the web service, but the impact is in the two or three people down the chain of command who are actually using the data. So understand how the data are used by understanding the environment in which people use it. So this user engagement is not strictly a pairwise relationship between me and the next deliverable, but it's how the system works together and bringing all of those players in so the user understands how, how they're operating and we can be more effective. This refocus of our activities has forced us to change the way that we manage our program, the way that we define and meet requirements, and the way that we revise those requirements as the demands and the needs change over time. So if you look at the space architecture um, going forward, in the next 10 years, I put 2032 as a timeline here, we envision the red circles show new NOAA assets which don't currently exist, need to be revitalized. So for us, we're looking at a dozen different satellites that all have to be developed with a new mantra in mind. But the partner assets are equally changing and equally capable. So the system is going to be twice what we have now or three times what we have now with only a small, with at no additional cost to NOAA over what we did in the implementation of GOES and JPSS because we're focusing on um, taking advantage of those technology investments, but also focusing on the ground systems, on the data and information exchangeability, the interoperability, and the partnerships we developed with our international partners so we can use their data and they can use ours effectively and efficiently. And it's really where the information matters that comes across that is the most critical um, that, we have, that we realize here. So we are working to do everything we can to minimize those barriers to use, to uptake by the community we work with. So ongoing right now this year and over the near term is we're moving many of our historical on-prem, they call it on-prem IT functions, into the cloud. Historically, we would, if we launch, we would design a satellite, we would build a ground system around that satellite, we would build an archiving system that supports that, and then we'd add that to our existing system. And it would run for 20 to 25 years, and then we do it again with the next generation. We cannot afford to or expect to build our own hardware or need to build our own hardware for all of those IT systems anymore. Some things must still be on site. We're not going to, you know, for operating our satellites, for example, for security reasons, there are some pieces of our overall architecture that would be on premises. But many of our functions, data dissemination, data ingest, product processing, data transmission can be done in the cloud. And we have active research going on in pilots and actual operational systems now working with multiple cloud service providers to see that this becomes the benchmark and that this enables a much larger global integration of data from other sources um, in a way that we could never scale with the old model. We are developing AI and machine learning applications that can be applicable in a number of different ways. For operations, certainly, um, I mean, I mentioned the overflow, the tsunami of data, and how we can overwhelm users. Um, we that goes picture that I showed, which you can see movies of those. You can imagine the challenge to an uh, to a weather forecast officer trying to figure out what to look at or what what is the focus I need to look at here? Is it a storm? Is it dust? Is it tornadoes? Is it lightning in one area and and um, severe winds in another area? And, and how to sift through the volume of data which never stop. So with the AI and machine learning applications, we hope to be able and expect to be able to do an initial sifting of those in a way that pinpoints to the, and, and bringing in data from multiple sources to alert the weather forecast officer where they should be looking. We have a product we call Prob Severe, which is a probability of severe weather, which does just that. It looks at in small in precursor indications of, of storms, of, of weather patterns, and then brings those to the forecaster and says, focus your attention with your GOES imagery or your, your low Earth orbit imagery in this region because we expect in the next 30 minutes or 60 minutes, this is where you're going to see something happening. And that kind of, that kind of multi-sensor, multi-platform integration takes that challenge away from the user and puts it on the, uh, the, I, the IT system. And this that's just one area, but also um, end user applications and bringing all these data together allows us for to do data driven science in a way that we haven't in the past because you have access to interoperable data sets from across the world. Um, we are redesigning our ground systems, as I mentioned before, to be flexible and scalable, which allows us then to bring on a new mission which might have 
equivalent data flow to what we see from uh, five other missions in the past without having to rebuild a ground system. We buy more computing power. We buy more throughput. Um, and the, the uh, and our cloud partners are able to provide that in a, in a secure and efficient way. And we're designing our next generation archives and data centers so that they can take these observations, not just from satellites, but from in situ, airborne, ocean observations, acoustic and imagery data sets, and bring those all together in a common cloud framework. Um, what we have, the problem we have now is that we have so much data, we don't have the output to, to deliver it to the user, and we don't want to ship data everywhere. We want the users to come to the data and process it and understand it and have access to it without having the massive transport of data requirements that, that historically is the way we've done in the past. We're also, in by leading in this vision of bringing all the data together, coordinating with NASA, USGS, with UMETSAT, and our other international partners to do a similar way so all the global data sets would be equally available and accessible. And by setting metadata standards and search and discovery standards and operating principles, we expect to be able to make all of these data interoperable so they, the user puts a real language query into the challenge and to understand something that doesn't need to know the pedigree of every instrument that's in there. We provide that sanctity or that, that, that um, certitude verification of the data sets and the, the user just has to know what the problem he or she is trying to solve. All of these are active pilots and activities within NESDIS. We expect in the next five years, our entire system will look entirely different than it did five years ago. So this is just a schematic showing the concept in our NESDIS cloud framework is to ingest data from multiple sources. Um, and it, it, there's a, sometimes a perception that our satellite data are, these are the data volume uh, monsters that we have to deal with. But when you start thinking about in situ, um, it, you know, acoustic data and bathymetric data um, vid and video data, the volumes of those data sets are even larger and more massive. So bringing those in in a way that are uh, digitally searchable is, is an equal challenge to this. It's not going to be easy, but it's part of the longer term application. And the commercial side is, is here as well, whether we buy data from the commercial sector, but there could be a two-way here and how the, the commercial sector, we see non-real-time operators, the public, et cetera, is bringing the commercial, the commercial applications, which we don't own, but we enable by the making the data available, will we expect to have significant economic value um, because of the value of information is, is something you can use many times and not dilute its value by having it apply in many different places. So our, our secure ingest is a way to bring in data from, from multiple sources outside our firewalls and make it secure and make it operable for our high security, high reliability system. But then by having that common portal, all the data look the same once they get um, into our systems. And that's, that's sort of the vision I give a lot of credit to uh, the CIO and our, our data management team at NCEI for thinking these things through um, and figuring out a framework as we work with Amazon and Google and, and Microsoft and NASA and other partners to do this in a scalable way on a national scale. Um, and one thing I want to bring up, and this is almost the last slide, we're getting to close to the end here, is that the, the, the intelligence that envisions and conceives of the next generation instruments is, is essential and is what makes possible these leaps forward in observing technologies and in information technologies. But the, the larger community that uses the data is really where the innovation comes from. Um, it's, it's really where you get the, once you make information available, you make the content and the, and the visual, you provide initial visualization, that's where the different disciplines, somebody who doesn't know how to build a satellite, but knows how to understand how the, the biology of a coastal water system works, and then can see connections because of information is now available, and then feed that back into the loop is so key. So in order for this to be successful for NESDIS and for NOAA, we recognize that all disciplines and communities are necessary, from the user community, because they're the ones who use the data, but from the climate and environmental in, uh, community who understand the ecosystems and the people, that's where the changes and where the impact comes, and, and using the data is really key. The technology advance allows us to see more than before. The data science allows us makes the availability of, of unexpected discoveries um, and really opens up, I think, ex explosively expands the, the applications 
of the observations we make. Who, who would have thought years ago that global, that visual observations of, of the Earth looking for land use changes would be used by somebody to do economic analysis of competitors by looking at the number of cars in a parking lot. But by seeing that data in real time, you can see customer traffic. And you can determine you know, as we, you know, how, how busy a particular region is. Or those are, that's a kind of an application which has found real use. Or we put a, a data, a, day night, a night band, which allows us to look at shipping lights, which we put in there to look at low light illumination of clouds. But now that imagery on VIRS on our low Earth orbit satellite allows us to track illegal fishing because fishing boats tend to wander across international boundaries at night and illegally fish. We can see those now. They turn off their transponders, but they don't turn off their lights because they got to see the fish. So a whole business, a whole application of using that satellite data to track illegal fishing grew out of that, which was not, it may have been thought of as possible, but it was not marketed that way as a requirement, but it immediately becomes an application which is useful and beneficial. So it's the diversity of our workforce in the implementation, but it more essentially even in the utilization that allows us to expand and enhance the value of the observations that we make and the products that we deliver from those observations. We may be data scientists experts, but we're not user experts yet, and we need that partnership uh, for that to be successful. So these, these are coming together, I think, at a really critical time for us. Um, the, we, I think we based on our understanding not just of the global picture, but of the environmental observations, we are just beginning to understand the Earth as an integrated system now in the last 10 years, and, and really for the first time. And, uh, and I put here maybe just in time, because the criticality of the observations we make and the connections we can establish are really essential to the value. Um, and that's the ultimate impact and the value that we want to provide to the, to the planet, because these measurements, these observations are so critical whether it's the annual climate report, the state of the climate, which we produce out of NESDIS with the uh, American Meteorological Society every year, or our inputs into the national climate assessments, there is no mistake that the impacts of what we're seeing, the changes in our system are happening, and our understanding of those connections are still, start, are still growing, but they're much better now. We need, to, we need this kind of information set. We need this capability that's coming from the satellites and the ground systems and working together to make this happen. So it, it places on us all a responsibility, and borrowing a little bit from, from Spider-Man here, that with great knowledge does come great responsibility. And the responsibility is that we have to do something with the information we have and with the capabilities we have. We have to advertise and broadcast, speak up on what we have, inform the public and the communities that we support and what is available and what is known and really act on those information and those data. Um, and, for, and each of us has a role. I see for our role in NOAA is to, is to highlight the changes that we see and the events that we can monitor and understand, to highlight the impacts of an effect, the cause and effect. And we are seeing now cause and effect. Even for the, climate, the billion dollar disasters and the weather, we can actually see a tributation, attribution of the issue, of the significant storm to particular um, environmental factors that we can understand. So those are key, and those are what really drives us, and drives our agency, drives NESDIS to do this correctly, to do this better and faster and needed. It's, it's, a, it's a really critical need that we have as an organization. So that's where we are. That's what um, where NESDIS stands as the, and not as, as sort of as we call it the middleware of, of environmental system that NOAA provides but an essential part, and, and we, we benefit from the great work that all the other parts of NESDIS and all the other parts of NOAA and our partners do. So with that, I'll pause. We, I'll stop, and we have time for some questions. I think we had also a, a, a poll question to put out to the audience, and got plenty of time for some feedback from the community here. Great. Thanks, Dr. Volz. That was great. And the poll question that uh, Dr. Volz put out is, why NESDIS, what NESDIS images or products do you use on a regular basis? So we just want to get some feedback on what's useful to you. If you'll go ahead and type your answers in, and then we'll broadcast the results a little later. And uh, thanks for a great presentation, Dr. Volz. And now we'll get into the um, Q&A. And um, please use the lower Q&A box to enter your questions and comments. And today we have Todd Harding, Deputy Chief of Staff of NESDIS, moderating the questions for Dr. Volz. We will get to as many questions as we can, but we may not have time for all of them. 
Okay, take it away, Todd. So yeah, Todd, why don't you just present the, just speak the questions for me. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, ahead, Todd. Great. Yeah, right now I'm not uh, I'm not seeing any specific questions in in the box yet, uh, Steve. I did post uh, some some examples while you were talking through your presentation of uh, articles and uh, other areas to explore on our website related to the information uh, you were sharing. So uh, maybe some folks are are looking at. So that I find as looking as well. at the poll question, which is a good start here. Um, I see a lot of the ocean observations, whether it's coral reef or or the like, um, are, as key. And I think one of the challenges that uh, I've put on our team is that. We have historically been supplying the weather service for so many years, and that's been the, the nuts and bolts, the bread and butter of what we do in Nesbitt. But the value of the um, the wet side, as we say, fisheries management, oceanography, um, coastal zone inundation, um, vegetation health, are areas where there's a lot of capacity, um, not just in NOAA satellites, but globally, that we can really be, we should be, that's a growth area that we are capable of status of working with. And I'm, I'm glad to see some of those products identified as as um, uh, valued by the community here on this, on this call. We do have a question from Anon in Inamar who asks, are there specific examples of satellite applications for the current pandemic situation? So that's, yes, that's a good question. And we actually, when the COVID kicked in um, early this year, we. NESDIS working with OAR and with NASA Earth Science got together and said, let's do, what do we do to observe the effects of the, the global pandemic that was then just starting up? Um, we obviously can't image the coronavirus. That would be great if we could. Uh, but we are tracking the, the changes that are basically a result of human act activity changes. Now, there's the obvious stuff that's like when you, fewer airline flights are leading to less um, clear skies. Um, but we're also it's much more pervasive this time, um, lower ship traffic, lower air, air, you know, car traffic, so the, the air is cleaner. Um, and we, so we're tracking all of that very carefully with a global observing campaign, not just U.S., but the Europeans and our, our, all of our colleagues are looking at this and collecting the data in a comparable way and um, in an interoperable way. And we, and I hope and expect that since this, um, we're, we're, I, I, I want to be cavalier about this, but we're doing a global experiment here as individual regions shut down individual portions of their government, their industry, their nation. And, and, they, and we will see the reverse of that as individual regions, one at a time, turn those back on. And we expect to be able to, uh, given the sensitivity of our observations in the multispectral, we can look at trace gases, we can look at veg, you know, all kinds of different parameters, to be able to see the individual effects of these turnoffs and turn-ons on the environmental systems that we live with. The water quality is affected by one industry more than by another, potentially. The air quality is affected more by cars and less by power plants or vice versa. So as we see these different effects and we can integrate those observations with the economic and the, the industrial observations and data sets, we should, we hopefully can tease out better an understanding of the intercoupling between human interactions and the environment um, in a way that can be helpful for decision makers trying to decide where, as we try and adapt our systems to be less impactful of the earth, um, where and how we can do that effectively. So it's an, it's an experiment. It's going on right now. We're making, still making the observations, uh, but we're, already, we're obviously seeing a lot of the obvious things of the better air quality um, and changes in some of the water uh, quality and the shipping traffic. And even to the extent it's quieter in the oceans now than it was before, because we have sh fewer ships, is that changing the population of the, the migration patterns of the fish and the like? These are things we expect to be able to understand better um, and for a good purpose, I hope. So, Steve, we have a, a question here on uh, 5G uh, capability and spectrum. Uh, so your thoughts on that? I did post in response to that an article we, we had on spectrum that sort of shows the interference, but uh, uh, can you comment on, on the concerns related to, the, to that spectrum interference? Sure. And for those who are not, may not be familiar with it, the spectrum issue, if you will, for, for NOAA is that most of the observations we make from satellites are passive. We, we basically observe the Earth and look for emittance, the radiation coming from the Earth, 
whether it's mostly temperature data um, or, or you know, it's radio spec radio frequency spectrum. So we look for warm and cold uh, water vapor emissions, and and that there are certain transparent windows in the atmosphere which are which radiate better than others, and those are the ones we've keyed in on over the last 50 years and observing the Earth. Those spectra areas adjacent to those are places where the 5G, particularly at 24 gigahertz, is looking for bandwidth to be able to use for um, active um, transmitting. You can imagine an active transmitter sitting right in the middle of a passive window, which we're using to monitor water vapor, could be a significant noise effect. So that's the background. So uh, we're working with the there is a whole um, international regime of monitoring and maintaining of ba barriers between these different bands so that they don't interfere, but they do, um, especially as you get closer and more powerful. So we have looked at particular pieces of our observing system which are affected by these. Um, and they, the concern is that if it gets too large, they can take out a whole measurement and datum channel that we've used historically and we lose that information. Um, initial assessments were it could be more severe than we've seen it right away. It is a longer, in the particular in the 24 gigahertz, it is a longer term concern about what's possible and it's once you open a commercial um, the channel to a commercial sector, it's hard to turn it off again. So we are watching that carefully um, and working with the technology to see with the vendor, the commercial sector to see can they be better in their, you know, noise reduction across adjacent bands. And can we be more sensitive in the way that we detect those bands? So it's an ongoing, we, we, we use something called risk management as we do our systems. We list this as a long-term risk and a near-term risk that we're trying to mitigate by technology in the way that we observe the band um, and by working with the vendor, the commercial sector, and how they um, populate their, their portion of the sector. Um, it, will, it will have an impact. Um, uh, many things, uh, the human imprint is, shows up in a lot of different places already and is masking the natural signal, so to speak. Um, uh, but we hope that it will be localized to the big cities, to, you know, places where you have uh, high density 5G. Um, and we're continuing to work with uh, NASA and our other partners on assessing the, the overall impact on weather forecast and the like. Uh, we don't have the answer to it yet, but that's an active area of research to understand the, the net effect it might have on our forecast. Okay, Steve, uh, the next one is from uh, Shaquilla Merchant, uh, and, it, and it comes from our, our cooperative institutes. So uh, given that uh, we're transitioning to a digital environment, including AI and machine learning, uh, how can we, as a NESDIS academic partner, engage our NOAA-funded students and scholars and early career professionals through experiential research and training. Um, do we have a plan now or in the future for creating such pathways uh, to benefit our academic partners to, to create a diverse and competent workforce? That's, that's a great question, Shaquilla, and I appreciate it. Yes, um, uh, as I said, the area where the most, I think the, the biggest change in our, system, our mission system will be in data analytics and in uh, the IT systems and the way that we manage and, and distribute and coordinate data. Um, so I think, and that is not uh, that is not your traditional remote sensing society, remote sensing community of, of expertise. Um, I'm not saying that those remote sensing is not important, but the growth area, if you will, is going to be in data and analytics. And I think uh, we should be looking to and identifying with our um, all of our partners, but particularly our uh, community of academic groups that are looking for near early career to identify and uh, challenges in information management and in, um, in computing and machine learning and artificial intelligence along all those lines I mentioned earlier in my talk and actually supporting that from a NESDIS perspective and I've been talking with our own team internally about establishing um, a longer term pipeline so that we are looking for not just who are we going to hire next year, but what do we want to look like in five years and in seven years? And how do we make, um, how do we establish the, the early training uh, fellowships or internships targeted towards data analytics and data exploitation um, to become a long-term contributor to, to NOAA and to NESDA? So I'm looking forward to uh, working that with you. I know you're at the, the CRSST group in, in CUNY, um, but other partners along the same lines to really start training people on the NOAA-specific kind of applications of, 
uh, as I talked about, with merging of data of multiple types, but with a particular end user community in mind. So look for more in that, but as you and I have talked over the last year about setting up something more formal so that there is a community that is well, com we communicate well our, our, our sort of 10-year objectives with near-term milestones two, four, six, and eight years out so that you can actually start the pipeline and get it set up so people can be contributing to it and, and, and see a future in a particular field that NOAA supports. So, Steve, while we're on the uh, AI and machine learning, uh, Drew Belling has asked, is there an example that you know of uh, where you're currently using AI and, and machine learning? Yeah, um, I'll give a real specific targeted one. I mentioned the uh, the prob severe, the probability of severe um, events, and that's not really, that's a little bit of AI, but I'll give a different one. Um, a little background is one of our instruments, the Advanced Baseline Imager on GOES, is um, the one that you saw those beautiful pictures, and you, this, actually the background thank you here shows that as well. One of our instruments on GOES 17, which is now GOES West, had a thermal problem after launch, and the cooling system didn't work well. So the result of that was for significant portions of the year, the infrared channels, which have to be cooled to around 60 Kelvin, were not cold enough to work. So for a particular time of the day or at night, because they're looking, the sun was peeking into the aperture, those detectors would be overwhelmed. So we had the problem that those IR channels are the ones that are so key for winds and, and the forecast, particularly during severe storms and hurricanes and the like, were blind. So we used machine learning for a couple of different ways. One, the old way we would do calibration of instruments is we would develop a cal curve, which um, would present, you know, the output based on the, you know, photons in is radiance out, um, and we would recalibrate if the curve changed over time. But we didn't usually change it. But now we had a situation where this instrument, the temperature was setting was changing over time, um, where it wouldn't be at 60 K and stay there. It would go to 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. Under the previous approach, once it left 62 Kelvin, I'll make the number up, but once it left a certain range, it would go black. But we knew from watching it that the, the temperature over time varied in a very consistent way. And we knew we could calibrate it at 65 K. We could calibrate it at 70 and at 85 K. Above 85 or so, it went dead. So, But over a whole range, more than half of that affected loss time under the old regime, it could still be used if we could adapt it. So what we did is we did predictive calibrations using machine learning to actually say factor in then the expected temperature curve and when the temperature reaches a certain point, put in a new calibration. Um, and so we adapt, we have sort of adaptive calibration curves that were built in into the system and into the processing of the data because our latency is minutes on these data sets. We don't have time to do this post-processing. So that the machine learning then learns how to anticipate the changes in temperature and learns how to adapt the calibration curve so the user, the weather forecast officer, didn't have to do any of that. They just knew they had twice as much time on this detector than they would have had under the previous regime. So we're looking at that's one specific example where we found that way in the operating system. We can increase the efficiency or the effectiveness of the instrument uh, for applications. Okay, Steve, Izello uh, is asking about um, moving into this new paradigm uh, and how do you bring the people and the culture of NESDIS along with, with our aspiration and, and vision? Um, that What I've learned in, in, as a leader in NESDIS is that changing the culture is the most difficult part of our job. Um, and not for negative reasons by any stretch. The culture that defines an organization is really, the, it is, often, in, in our case at NOAA, is the strength of our organization. People work with NOAA because they love the mission, and they love, they like the, the satisfaction, the delivery that they do. So um, changing a system that's not broken but will be impaired in the future is even harder than changing a broken system because you have to first compel, you have to explain why, sort of the burning platform argument, but why change is necessary. And, and we've done that within NESDIS over the last couple of years, uh, that one chart I showed about the number of satellites and the contrib relative contribution of NOAA is a piece of that explanation, is to explain to, to get the team on board with change is necessary in order to survive and to thrive, and that no change is more risky and more and dangerous than not than change. And that's step one. So that's telling somebody to have a burning platform doesn't tell them where to jump. 
The next step is to show a path to how they, in, in, as an individual and as a community, can add value and really contribute to and make possible the better future that we have in mind. And, and the, the, the significant change within NES is beyond um, just uh, what, that I talked about, that we're not the only satellite in space, is getting the different, is sharing the burden of risk, um, particularly in that the way we built in the past, we owned all the aspects from the requirements to the ground system to the delivery system. Now we have to share many of those different attributes or parts of that system with partners. And getting that, that trust to be expanded beyond um, what I can control to what I can influence and how I can partner has been the next step. It's been the challenge. And we have set up a number of different community engagement activities internal in NESDIS. We've set up change champions within NESDIS to have the working level be well aware of the decisions that are influencing, the, the, the data that are influencing executive decisions so that they're better aware of the, the driving functions that are forcing us to consider different changes. But it's never done. It's an ongoing process. And, and getting that feedback of what's working and what isn't and why something is compelling and why it isn't is really key. And I think there's no substitute for having an open channel of communication and actually letting those that channel be an influencer as well as just a communicating device and letting the, the workforce throughout the organization know that they have an input and that they can influence the end state that we have by their, by their impact and by their contribution. Um, I don't think we've got it solved, but uh, we are definitely dedicated to making sure that the, the communication goes both ways and the influencing of where we go is, is, is shared by all. And Steve, uh, I know we're at. Hey, the Steve, this break. is Tracy. I just want to make. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to make sure you were comfortable answering a few more questions, or we can call it now, and people can send. We'll try and get address the rest of the people's I, questions offline. Uh, we can go to three fifteen if there's an interest. Yes, there is. I'm, there's a lot of questions. Thank you. Go okay, ahead, Todd. So, uh, Steve Jack uh, Settlemayer is asking, uh, given the stated increase in uses. Uh, from this versioning data, have you altered your NESDA staff to adapt to the opportunities for greater user engagement and collaboration? It has been, um, short answer is yes, but not enough. Um, so yes, uh, as we, uh, remember the chart I showed, which showed the five strategic objectives and four and five were user engagement and product development. Um, the user engagement objective as a standalone objective didn't exist two years ago. Um, and we have significantly uh, augmented. We've added uh, capacity in our chief of staff office and our public affairs, not our public affairs, but our, our, our front office um, with a, a chief a lead of communications, Renata Lana, and she has added to her staff several folks as well to help coordinate the um, sort of the focus on user engagement. But we also realized that there was a lot of this happening throughout the organization. It wasn't that we weren't doing user engagement, it's that we were um, to be a little abstract, we were all doing user engagement. We all thought it was part of our, just another piece of our job. But part of the refocus allows us to then to coordinate those activities better so that it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's, dis it's, it's not counterproductive, but it's discoordinated and it's uncoordinated. And bringing this together allows us both with a few extra hires in uh, at the leadership or the coordination function, but the better focus of the execution throughout um, has allowed us to make initial steps. But those are just initial, and I've also focused on that we, we need to broaden that engagement. And we're going through a series of workshops, for example, this summer, where we have a geo, our next generation geo user engagement workshop. And I, there's a lot of capacity and interest out there in the community to, to speak up, and this is what I want to see, and this is what I want to have happen. So leveraging our partners in NASA and in the community um, to contribute and to be a part of the conversation is another step, which we don't have to pay for that, but we have to show value that people have to see value in their contributions. And by opening up these fora and, and coordinating the integration and the interaction allows those contributions to, to see some value. It's not enough, and I think we, as we look towards our requirements definition, the way that we handle management of, of product development, we're going to spend more time and effort and, and and exploiting this and, and actually investing in personnel to do this. Back to Shaquille Merchant's question earlier, um, I think that's part of our growth area 
um, in the employment and in, in the uh, workforce at NOAA and Inesis over the coming decade to do better at this, to make this a, a key discipline of organization. Okay, Steve. Um, and Tony uh, Ryer of National Marine Sanctuaries is interested in the possibility of using satellite data to monitor visitor use at our site. Uh, wondering if there are any products available that, that would help with that uh, to observe visitor activity. To visitor, uh, I presume uh, we, we don't have quite a resolution to see individual people yet. Um, that would be NRO, and you can talk with them about tracking individuals. Um, but if you're talking about ships and the like, I, I, that's a good question. I, don't, I, I, I could talk for a long time and not give you an answer. That would not be my intention. Um, I don't know that we can, other than the impact of those visitors on the uh, community that your uh, your your resource, your agent, your area. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question, but I think other than looking at ships, if there's ship traffic, we can see that usually. Um, but that that would be the the only place I think we might be able to help you. Okay, and. Um there was a question uh, from Tracy, actually, about uh, who coordinates the placements of all the satellites in space? Um, it takes a village. It takes a community. Um, so uh, we have the, what's called the Coordinating Group for Meteorological Satellites, or CGMS, that has been around for 40-plus years. All the med agencies in the world are members of it. Um, and the WMO is sort of one of the convening authorities of that, so to speak. So. We have, over that time period, established certain orbits that different agencies cover uh, in order that we get the right blanket coverage of the Earth with the right frequency of the different kinds of cameras and um, sound instruments. So, for example, for numerical weather forecasting, um, we use mostly uh, microwave and we use sounding, temperature, pressure, or humidity profiles of the atmosphere. And we do that in three different orbits, in the early morning orbit, a 10.30 orbit, and then a 1.30 afternoon orbit, which is across the time at the equator. And we have, through practice and, and agreements over time, apportioned those to the Department of Defense, to the UMETSAT, and to NOAA. Um, and so that's, that's an example of the constellation of similar observations that are then integrated. There are other ones where we're doing imagery um, and where we're doing, uh, for example, scatterometry for surface vector winds where we have similar nature. And it's, it's done through these coordinating bodies that we have. CEOS is another one, the Community of Earth Observing Satellites. Um, and it's all very collaborative. And, and in fact, where we have had examples where a nation would want to fly something in a particular orbit because it would be good for them. Um, and yet the community would then say, you know, that's great, but if you move two hours to the you know, earlier in the day, your satellite will not only help you some, a lot, but will be significantly impactful for the globe. And um, the nations have moved and, and adjusted uh, based on that kind of community feedback. So it's a, it is a collaborative. And I, I was impressed by um, the ability of these often com, um, conflicting or at least competing nations to work together in this forum. My first CGMS meeting when I came to NOAA with Russian and Chinese and US and Indian who uh, might be arguing somewhere else were very working very collaboratively about how we're going to manage the constellation satellites we're flying together. So that's how we do it. Um, and it's been very successful and productive over the years. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, and then we have uh, Colby Brady. Uh, fisheries electronic monitoring on fishing vessels is expanding in many U.S. fisheries. Um, but near real time or real time on vessel data sharing could have high value in reducing protected species interaction uh, if the hardware was capable of on vessel AI uh, machine learning analysis. Um, it, are you aware of any applications like this being considered for integration within the satellite and information services? Um, the on vessel AI, uh, which I, I imagine is something being used in the ship itself for its services, is not something we would necessarily work with. but the connection of those data sets to the global information system um, would be, I'm not aware of the moment of, of how we may be bringing those into the system in near real time. We do have the DCS, which is the data collection system, which allows for in situ remote sites to beam their data um, basically up to our geostationary satellites for retransmission back to the ground so we can integrate it 
without having to actually go to those remote sites, buoys and and uh, you know stream ga stream gauges and the like. So I would think there would be a capacity there uh, if it's not being utilized already to use our our GCS um, rebroadcast a transmission system to link those ship based um, observing assets to the global systems they can be brought on board or brought into the network faster if it's not being done. It's a good question. We might want to follow up with you later and see if it's not already being done in some degree, in some way. Okay, and Steve, I think if I'm tracking properly, I think we're down to, to the last question here, and it's from Hernan, asking about uh, what NESDIS, what success with NESDIS uh, reimagined look like to you? Um, and NESDIS reimagined is our uh, cultural change uh, effort that we currently have uh, taking place within NESDIS. I think the two things, I'll put it in two different areas. Um, one area is that uh, we have had a bunch of individual examples of success in terms of, um, we call it the proving grounds or the risk reduction programs where we have prepared our user community for um, ready and, and efficient uptake of new observation capabilities as they come on board. GOES-R system and the JPSS system both did that. I think one, uh, one evidence of success would be scaling that up to be observing system-wide and not just satellite-based. Um, and we are starting to do that to see how we can make that demonstration of good performance and make that uh, applicable not just to NOAA assets but to these other um, international assets that we want to bring on board so that we don't just, again, flood the uh, user with data that they don't know how to deal with. The second idea of success would be through our user engagement, we have historically done well working with the Weather Service but we have historically not done well in making our satellite um, systems and data systems effectively used by the, the ocean service or the fishery service. Um, and I think uh, one example of this working better is through our user engagement to have a better feel for the, to get our feet wet, to get in the environment of the user communities and the fisheries, the oceans, so that we understand the application of information better for your, for those communities so that we don't, so we're sending, we're helping them to, uh, with, in, with um, satellite data, number one, but also in the data and integration even more so, so that we can help that, that previous question about the ship um, traffic and ship data, so that we can help with our in, information capabilities and data analytics to bring your data into a common architecture so that it can, it can be more useful to you. But we can't do that until we, and as part of the NESIS we imagined in our user engagement, is to understand the environment our users are working in and then to be better able to help them solve their problems um, through our, our expertise joined with theirs. All right, Steve. So I think that concludes as we near the uh, 315 mark. Um, I believe uh, uh, Hernan, maybe uh, I'll turn it over to you to close. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, thank you for everybody for joining us today. We are taking a break in August, but our next seminar will be on Tuesday, September the 8th, and our speaker will be Benji Spencer, who is the Chief Engineer and Director of Engineering Standards Office of Planning and Programming for Service and Delivery at the NOAA's National Weather Service. Mr. Spencer will present Empower to Lead, Inspiring the Next Generation of Leaders. Please join us. And also would like to announce that uh, Dr. Neil Jacobs uh, will speak in October and Dr., uh, Mr. Uh, Amiro Gallaudet might speak in December. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Volz. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye. And thanks, Todd and Michelle, for helping. Yeah, nice job, Todd. Thank you. And Hernan, thank you, and Tracy. Good. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dr. Volz. Bye-bye.